Hello, I am Peter Okwache. Welcome to Focus on Africa. Our top stories. The UN rejects Kenya's bid to blacklist Al-Shabaab as a terrorist organization. We'll ask Somalia's UN ambassador why. Japan pledges to help Africa double its rice production by the year 2030, but at what cost to the continent? The World Health Organization urges people in Kenya and Uganda to stay vigilant after it discovers a fake version of a popular antibiotic in pharmacies. Also on the program, Uganda's former leader, back in focus. The Ugandan Museum in Kampala exhibits never-before-seen photographs of former president Idi Amin. And in sports, the UEFA Champions League draw has taken place. Defending champions Liverpool will be facing a familiar opponent from last season. Thanks for joining us here on Focus in Africa from BBC World News. The UN Security Council has rejected a proposal from Kenya to designate Al-Shabaab as a terrorist group. The group is already targeted under broader sanctions known as Resolution 751, imposed by the United Nations and Somalia. Kenya wants to tighten the screws, but UN agencies and humanitarian organizations believe such a move could have the effect of criminalizing the supply of humanitarian aid, which Somalia desperately needs. Kenya has dealt with major Al-Shabaab attacks in, on its soil in the last few years. In September 2013, gunmen stormed the Westgate shopping mall in Nairobi, resulting in a siege which left at least 67 people dead. A total of 148 people died when gunmen attacked Garissa University in eastern Kenya, targeting Christian students in April 2015. Over three years ago, Al-Shabaab militants admitted attacking a Kenyan military base in Somalia's El Adi town. Somalia's then-president, Hassan Sheikh Mahmoud, said about 180 soldiers were killed. The Kenyan military, though, disputed the number but refused to give their death toll. And earlier this year, Somali militants stormed a luxury hotel, Dusit D2, in Nairobi. 21 people were left dead. Well, we can go live now to speak to Ambassador Abukar Dahir Osman. He's Somalia's permanent representative to the UN. Mr. Ambassador, why was Kenya's proposal rejected? Well, um, uh, well thank you. Uh, the Kenya's proposal was rejected because it was uh, uh, not doing anything that they say that it will do. Uh, well, actually, it was redundant. And as I said uh, before, uh, any initiative or proposal by anybody uh, regarding on uh, to combat violent extremism or terrorism should be uh, should advance rather than hinder um, our common uh, objective of achieving uh, peace and security and stability in the whole region so we uh, um, um, along with all the humanitarian uh, organizations that are working in Somalia the UN and other international NGOs see this as a hindrance actually to uh, humanitarian um, 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 uh, field in, in Somalia. And but, as you but know, Mr. Ambassador, uh, if, I may just, if I may just come in here, I mean, it, it is surprising to me and uh, I'm sure to many of your viewers that the UN would not consider a group like Al-Shabaab, which terrorizes people in your country, Somalia, as a terrorist organization. Well, that is actually uh, not true. Uh, the UN, uh, especially in the Security Council, uh, Somali government and all international NGOs and UN agencies and all around the world recognize the Shabaab as a terrorist organization. Well, as then such, what is wrong with tightening the screws on them? Well, this, this is not tightening screws. This is a tightening and creating havoc on uh, distribution of humanitarian because the resolution that already covers a Shabab has uh, a mechanism to uh, control the flow of weapons, uh, embargo on, uh, on uh, resources that they use to, uh, people, to create uh, havoc in, in the region or in, in Somalia, and also list individuals in the Shabab 
as a terrorist organization and then their assets can be freeze so this is not uh, screwing uh, uh, or tightening the screws for the al-shabaab this is literally is a creating uh, a, a problem and havoc on international humanitarian crisis as we speak today to somalia is facing because of the climate uh, shock and also uh, long droughts uh, Somalia is facing a famine uh, and this is why the international community which agrees in in, in principle a shabab is a is terrorist organization say no to this clause to uh, resolution 1267 and as we speak I think we are uh, we are asking the Kenyan government we ask them and we're asking them to work with us and implement the existing resolution 751. Okay, and Mr. Ambassador, I'm afraid I can, we are, I can guarantee you. We are, we are running out of time. Thank you very much for your time on the program. Ambassador Abukar Osman, Somalia's permanent representative at the UN. Thank you. Thank you. Now, the Uganda government is running a half year long exhibition of pictures of one of the country's past presidents, General Idi Amin, considered one of the worst leaders in the world. The exhibition, which began in May, comes 40 years after the end of Amin's regime, at a time when the population is changing its perspective on his legacy. Dieja reports from Kampala. Uganda, Idi Amin ruled Uganda with an iron fist for eight years after taking power in a coup in 1971. When he was toppled in 1979, Amnesty International estimated half a million people had died during his reign. Sarah Bananuka was only 21 when Amin came to power. A year later, her father and three brothers were executed for allegedly having links to rebel groups. She recalls life under his rule. So to those who had nothing to do with those people who were victims, enjoyed life. They, we, they, were, they even took advantage of that situation to kill others. Either they, were, they, they shared a woman that would, they would come and say you are, you are, you are fighting a mean. And that, but for them when they are really, uh, they are, they, they, they were, they are, they are killing somebody because of personal issues. Sarah is one of the many people that have come to Uganda's National Museum to see the exhibition called The Unseen Archives of Idi Amin. The rolls of never-before-seen footage had been discovered somewhere on the premises of Uganda's national broadcaster in 2015. Anybody coming to the exhibition will not find the Idi Amin regime stories they have heard about. This is because the organizers say they were trying to tell a positive story. We wanted to generate a discussion, but a discussion that comes from a positive side and then sum up all those things that happened and why we think they happened and what we should do for them not to happen again to this country. And yet Idi Amin was more brutal than Obote, but... Mwambusi Andebesa, a historian, believes the surge of positive regard for the brutal strongman president exists because the country's history has not been properly preserved and may soon be forgotten. History has been retold and rewritten by the successive regimes. So it appears as if now the history of Uganda began with the current NRM government and nothing is talked about Idi Amin. And as such, the young generation who did not experience Idi Amin firsthand do not have experiences of Idi Amin. Forty years on, the consequences of Idi Amin's rule remain, and the exhibition perhaps may provide a window to discuss them publicly. Dear Jean, BBC News, Kampala. Well, let's bring in the BBC's Catherine, Catherine Biarohanga, rather, who's reported extensively from Uganda for us. Catherine, I mean, how has this exhibition been received in, in, in the country? Let's look at the foot traffic, first of all, the amount of people who would go to see this exhibition. I wouldn't say it's a lot of people because it's in the Uganda Museum in the capital. Not a lot of people traditionally go to museums in of itself. So not a lot of people will see these images. 
But what it has sparked is this conversation. We're talking about it now on radio stations, on social media in Uganda. People are having the conversation about this history of Idi Amin. So it's allowed this window, window of discussion. But is this whitewashing history? I mean, we've just heard there in that report that, you know, by the end of his tenure, by the end of his time in power, half a million people had been killed. Do people know this history? It's a very young uh, population in Uganda today. Yes, this is not living history for most of Ugandans. Majority of the population is below the age of 30. They won't remember Idi Amin. All they'll see is the archive, maybe hear stories from their family members. What the authorities now are doing with this exhibition is they're trying to boost tourism to Uganda. They know that outside of the continent, people know Uganda for Idi Amin. Wherever I go, that people will say, oh, I remember Idi Amin, do you know him? So they want to capitalize on that. But in this, you're missing the brutality of his regime. But you're also not asking the questions, could this happen again? Some of the reasons that led to Idi Amin, a militarized state, power being held by a strong group of individuals. Some of these factors are present in Uganda to some extent. So you don't examine those issues. And, and, and you know, I mean, you've got personal ties to this story because, you know, you, you had ties to, um, to, to Idi Amin. Yes, my relatives on my mother's side are related to Idi Amin. And when I speak to them, there is a sense of loss, romanticization, because they personally benefited when he was in power. You also do see it with young Ugandans. The biggest story this week out of the country has been the relaunch of Uganda Airlines. When it was initially launched in 1977, it was Idi Amin who began Uganda Airlines. So some people in Uganda will look back and say, well, he had the country's interest at heart. But let's not forget there were people who disappeared. The country's economy was broken during his regime. And so what a lot of people question is, by romanticizing, selling this image of Idi Amin, are you just forgetting the brutality that happened during that time? Thank you very much for your insight into that story, Catherine Garuhanga. Thank you. Let's take a quick look now at other stories making the headlines across Africa and the rest of the world. An Egyptian television talk show host has been taken off air following comments about obesity. Reham Saeed described obese women as burdens to their families and the state and an, uh, uh, an eyesore. The ban is expected to last for a year. Saeed says she accepts the decision. An Ivory Coast has signed an agreement with Japanese car firm Toyota to build a car assembly plant in the country. Work to establish the plant is expected to begin by the end of this year. President Koulibaly is currently attending a Japanese Africa summit in Japan. And let's stay with that conference for our next story now, because Japan has pledged to help Africa double its rice production by 2030. The announcement was made at the 7th Tokyo International Conference on African Development, or TICAD-7, which is being attended by at least 25 African leaders in the Japanese city of Yokohama. Host Prime Minister Shinzo Abe said Japanese technology and innovation would play a key role in achieving this goal. But it's not the first time the East Asian country has promised financial support to the continent. In 2016, the Japanese government and private businesses pledged to invest $30 billion over the next three years. The Japanese foreign ministry claims they've now surpassed this target. The plan is now to help the continent produce 50 million tons of rice over 11 years. But Japan is competing with many other countries advancing into growing African economies, in particular China, which last year alone pledged 60 billion of economic assistance to the continent. Well, earlier today, I spoke to Shininchi Takeuchi, who is the director of African studies for the, Center, uh, for the University of Tokyo and foreign studies. I began by asking him what Japan really wants from Africa. The economic uh, uh, impact that uh, Japan can have uh, from Africa uh, will be uh, great. Uh, Japan uh, is now, uh, its population is decreasing, and uh, the, the country uh, seeks to uh, have uh, some economic opportunity uh, for its uh, economic growth. 
And Japan, uh, Africa is considered that very expected market uh, for Japanese company. So particularly Japanese government wants the Japanese company to make a, a economic activity in African continent. That is uh, one thing. And a political uh, aspect is also important. Uh, African countries are very uh, currently very important um, uh, in international politics. So Japanese government have a uh, very considered very important to have a good uh, relationship with African countries. Those are the two main reasons. Will Japan be able to catch up, um, if you like to put it that way, with China in terms of their relationship with Africa? Uh, it is true that uh, particularly the diplomatic side, uh, they, are, they consider this rivalry with China very important. Japan has their own reason to uh, to be to build strong uh, connections with Africa, and China has its own reasons. So, uh, emphasizing too much this kind of rivalry, I think it is not so constructive. And I just, you know, want to know what does the Japanese society, just normal people on the streets of Japan. How much of Africa do they know, and, and what do they think of, of Africa as a continent? Uh, increasingly important, and I really feel that uh, uh, a sort of feeling among the ordinary people are changing. Of, uh, of course, even today, Africa is uh, very far, and uh, some somewhat uh, image, romanticized image, uh, to Africa exist, uh, but uh, uh, if uh, we compare a uh, 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 decade or uh, two decades ago, uh, I think I feel a big difference uh, in, within Japanese society. Speaking there to Shinichi Takeuchi, who is the director of African Studies at the University of Tokyo. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwache. Still to come, Mimi with the sports. In football, find out which African star Southampton's summer signing, Mali international Musa Janepo, is being likened to. I'm Peter Okwache. The top stories this hour. The United Nations has rejected a bid by Kenya to designate the Somalia Islamist group Al-Shabaab as a terrorist group. And Japan has pledged to help Africa double its rice production by the year 2030. Prime Minister Shinzo Abe says Japanese technology and innovation will play a key role in achieving the goal and helping African families, uh, farmers rather, produce 50 million tons of rice over 11 years. People in Kenya and Uganda are being warned to stay vigilant after the World Health Organization discovered a fake version of a popular antibiotic in circulation. The batch of augmentin, which is a common pill used to treat various bacterial infections, was found in some pharmacies in both countries. The BBC's Mercy Juma has more from Nairobi. Augmentin is easily accessible with a prescription in many pharmacies across Kenya. It is a broad spectrum antibiotic that cures many bacterial infections. Now, WHO says the falsified product has been made in a packaging that is so close to what is original that it is, it is difficult for a consumer to say or to tell what is real and what is not. What I have here is Augmentin. 625 milligrams. Now, this is the original product, and its batch number is 864223. WHO says the fake products come in a batch number 786627. The imitations were discovered through a routine cost marketing surveillance, and they were also found in Uganda. Now, these drugs do not contain the active ingredients that they say they do have. And the danger of taking such drugs is that, one, they are either toxic to the body or the bacteria becomes resistant to other antibiotics or simply they just don't do the job they are supposed to do. Now, there have been no adverse effects reported to WHO, but the pharmacies and poisons board in Kenya and the WHO have asked anyone who's come into contact with any drug 
from that batch number to report to the relevant ministries or seek medical advice. Mercy Juma there in Nairobi. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. Time for some sports. Lots of champions need to talk about. Scrambling all the way down to make sure I got the story <laughs> for you guys. And the UEFA Champions League draw has been held in Monaco. Defending champions Liverpool will be facing a familiar opponent from last season with Napoli in Group E. Their African stars, which include Sadio Mane, Mohamed Salah and Joel Matip, will be hoping that they can retain the title. The Europa League winners, Chelsea, will be facing Ajax in Group H. Remember that wonderful performance from Ajax, who went all the way through to the semi-final in the last campaign. And two of the African stars who were exciting to watch last time around were Hakim Ziyech and Andre Onana, their goalkeeper from Cameroon. Still staying with football, Southampton manager Ralph Hasenhutl says his club's new signing, Moussa Genepo, has the potential to become the next Sadio Mane. The 21-year-old Mali international joined Southampton from Belgian side Standard Liège in June. He has so far played two English Premier League matches and scored his first goal last weekend. Hasenhutl said his positive mind and willingness to learn puts him in good position to follow in Mane's footsteps, a former player at the club. It's nice that they are comparing him immediately with Sadio. Um, indeed, he has a few, a few qualities we have seen uh, at the end of, of, of Sadio here when he was in Southampton. And um, because he's very quick and his movings are uh, phenomenal. And um, no, I, I, I think... Um, he was immediately welcome in this team because he has a fantastic uh, uh, friendly mind and and he's he's always happy and uh, and has always a good uh, yeah good atmosphere and um the players like him um and when they see that he he helps them uh, with scoring goals or winning balls or or um, yeah dribbling this is sure his biggest quality he has and the Africa Games action continues today in Rabat, Morocco. Many medals have already been won across the different competitions. Egypt still topped the medals table with 202 medals so far. And now Nigeria have jumped up to second place with 83 medals, picking up points when athletics started earlier this week. That means that South Africa are currently in third place. Now to the latest leg of the Diamond League Athletics Series, which starts today in Zurich. Some interesting events to look out for later today. In the women's 800 meters, keep an eye out for former world champion Yunus Cepkovic. Some in the men's 800 one to keep an eye on is Botswana's Nigel Amos, who is a 2018 African champion. And fresh from the Africa Games in Rabat, Morocco, will be Niger's Blessing Okagbare in the women's 200 meters. There is also the men's 100 meters final, which will feature South Africa's Akani Simbini, who is a 2018 African champion. To some other stories, making headlines in basketball, FIBA has a new president, but it's a familiar face. Former Mali sports minister Hama Niang was unanimously elected into his new role today. Niang has previously held roles as vice president of the organization, as well as FIBA Africa president. He will now serve in his new post until 2023. And staying with FIBA at their awards ceremony in China, Niger women's basketball team have been recognized as the most improved team for 2017 to 2019. If you remember, they won recently the 2019 Women's Afro Basket in Senegal for the second consecutive time. That's all the sport, Peter. You packed a lot in there. Ooh, quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Now, don't forget, you can get in touch with me and some of the team on social media. I'm at Okwache. But for now, from me and the rest of the Focus on Africa team, thanks for watching. Goodbye and see you soon.